housing summit today. The city of Traverse City is proudly partnered with them to bring you this keynote address because of its relevance to the needs of our region. My name is Linda Cobert, and as chair of the Traverse City Planning Commission, I'm honored to welcome our keynote speaker, Dan Parolik, author of Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to respond to today's housing crisis. Dan has kickstarted a movement to address the tremendous need for housing around the country, but he's here today to speak about strategies community like, communities like ours can pursue to offer a range of housing types that are walkable, desirable, and affordable. A number of our planning commissioners attended a virtual session inspired by this movement, and we all came away convinced that missing middle housing is exactly what we've been seeking to increase housing stock in a way that satisfies champions of protecting neighborhoods and new urbanists who want to increase density. In Traverse City, both the City Commission and Planning Commission have identified as a top priority opportunities to increase housing stock for people who live and work in the region. We have begun discussing changes to our zoning code to open up housing opportunities like duplexes, fourplexes, and bungalow courts inspired by Mr. Parolik's vision. Dan is an urban designer and architect and the founding principal of Opticos Design, which is focused on urban placemaking, innovating housing, innovative housing design and policy and zoning reform for walkable urbanism. He co-founded the nonprofit think tank, the Form-Based Code Institute, and has championed the missing middle housing movement. His book is now available from Island Press, which is linked on the Housing Summit website so you too can order a copy. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dan Parolik's pre-recorded session. It will be followed by a live Q&A scheduled for 3.30. Please email any questions to, to Lizette Reyes at info at housingnorth.org. Welcome, Dan. Great, thank you, Linda. So, well, it's great today to be here at the Northwest Michigan Housing Summit. And um, it's a topic that I'm obviously very passionate about. And I feel the, the primary reason that missing middle housing and the concept has spread so broadly now internationally is that it's given communities, regardless of their size, it might be a small rural hamlet or a larger city, the ability to talk about the need for diverse housing choices without using the, the typically loaded terms like density or upzoning or even multifamily in a lot of instances that bring an immediate negative response um, and framing to that conversation. And I'm gonna to talk today about some techniques that we have used in our practice over the past 20 years in both planning and, and sort of architecture projects to communicate this need effectively and to help win support from community members. I think what's really interesting is, is I'm not sure that um, you all knew this, but you could pick up a Sears and Roebuck catalog in the early 1900s and actually order a broad range of these missing middle housing types. I, I've seen as much of an eight as an eight plex in this in the Sears and Roebuck catalogs and have it delivered, all the parts delivered to your curbside. And so we've actually gone a really uh, a long way in the wrong direction in terms of the delivery of these housing choices and putting up barriers in place for these. The, the little duplex on the left hand side of this image is very similar to what my great grandmother lived in. Um, I grew up in a small town uh, of Columbus, Nebraska, a population of about 20,000 people. And she lived in this duplex and it was about a block and a half from the very vibrant Main Street. And it delivered everything that she needed for that period of her lifetime. And I would say, and I kind of joke that it also um, provided enough space at about 500 square feet for a world-class bakery as well. That's what I, I remember mostly about. Her apartment, and so um, uh, my so so right. These types have historically delivered these choices, and we've sort of systematically put up barrier after barrier. Um, and I'll talk about these barriers in a little bit in my presentation to 
not allow the delivery of these of these housing choices. Um, so the last couple of years have really been banner years for the implementation of missing middle housing across uh, the United States. Um, uh, in 2019, the state of Oregon passed Housing Bill 2001, um, which will enable um, triplexes and fourplexes on all lots in cities across the state, um, de depending on their size. It's a, it was a really big sort of milestone and missing middle application. Um, the state of Minneapolis um, also uh, in 2019 adopted housing policy that enabled uh, up to three units on any lot um, that even those that were currently zoned for single family housing. And so what both of these efforts did was was being very proactive in establishing policy and legislation to get ahead of and try to respond to the, the need for more affordable housing choices in these locations. And then um, I was happy to see that my home state of Nebraska uh, followed suit um, in just a couple months ago this year in August of 2020, um, the state legislation in Nebraska passed the Missing Middle Housing Act uh, that will allow multiple units on all lots um, in any city over the size of 20,000 20, people. And so, uh, right, there's, a, there's great momentum and a tremendous um, sort of push for the application to, to address housing issues that these states, regions, and cities are experiencing. And I've been following um, the state of Michigan's efforts for probably nearly a decade now, um, including this My Place effort, this statewide economic development strategy based on placemaking that did and does utilize the concept of missing middle housing and form-based coding, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, to apply um, and implement missing middle housing um, in these in jurisdictions across the state. And I will say that I was uh, very pleasantly uh, su surprised to see that um, your region had um, already completed uh, these target market analyses. And I, I, from what I understand, you they were first done in 2014. I think that was some of the state's uh, early efforts, and they have recently been updated. But this really this target market analysis establishes a really solid foundation um, uh, and justification for the application and the need for missing middle housings in, in the 10 counties that um, your uh, groups um, focus on. And so um, why is this such, a, such an important topic and, and how did we get here uh, with missing middle housing? Um, Right. If I'm not sure if you all are all aware, but um, there's been a tremendous shift in household demographics over the last um, 15, 15 to 20 years that really caught, I think, most cities, even most developers off guard uh, following the, the, the recession in, in 20, 2008 and became really evident and impactful uh, following that. But just simple statistics like today that 30% of households are composed of a single person. And I can tell you that the housing stock in any city that I've ever worked in or visited has not been designed, built and delivered, um, keeping in mind that single person household and specifically the needs of those households. Um, by 2025, uh, up to 85% of households will not have children. Um, that's a really sort of hard, and somewhat um, interesting st uh, uh, demographic uh, statistic that is hard to get your hands around, but the household sizes are shrinking. And by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. And so there's these tremendous shifts that are happening in the household demographics that change the types of housing we need to be delivering, and we've fallen short. And in addition, there has been a growing demand for walkable living, in particular missing middle housing, in the two big, big, biggest market segments. In um, uh, two thirds, uh, sorry, uh, one third of the baby boomer population um, is looking for this walkable living. And it might be in a really small town or a hamlet or a medium sized town. Um, all those different um, types of places can provide this walkability and two thirds of millennials who are the, the, the second largest market segment want this walkable living and missing middle housing is really posed position to deliver that walkability in the right locations. And um, these sorts of statistics about our rapidly aging population 
and the demand for walkability and quality of life for this aging population and, and the baby boomers is a primary reason that, that uh, AARP has become very interested and engaged in the missing middle housing conversation. We are currently uh, doing consulting for AARP where we, we deliver presentations, give walking tours, provide educational materials, um, uh, organize and um, sort of uh, manage conversations about these housing choices because they realize that as part of their livable communities initiative that these housing choices are a really core part of what their constituency both needs and wants um, in their daily lives. And right, an important part, and it sounds like a really focused part of your conversation, and, and this is not uncommon, unfortunately, in, in most parts of America, that there is an affordable housing crisis and that it's, it's only getting worse and worse. And just the statistic that 31% of American households are housing cost burdened is, is pretty staggering. You know, the, the cost of construction, the cost of land, the cost of labor, the cost of materials, cost of entitlement, all of those aspects of delivering housing have spiked dramatically over the course of the last three to five years in particular. And it's really um, tied builders' hands and uh, in many instances um, enabled, has, has um, made it to the point where they can't deliver attainable housing at price points in particular for entry level households and even rent, rent, rentable housing that's for rent um, is really out of reach for many of the households in, in cities and regions across the country. And what I noticed in your target market analysis is that this affordable or attainable price point is really a, a, a target and a really large need in your region both for the owner units as well as the rental units that are needed in your region. So that was a really um, telling uh, bit of information. And uh, how we got here and what do we need to change to address this, I think it's really, really important in all of my missing middle housing conversations to talk about one of the major barriers, which is an out of date zoning system. Or, and I feel that the, the zoning system that is in place currently is nearly 100 years old. It was put in place at about the same time this camera was created, and it cannot actually deliver the type of regulations and has put many barriers in place for delivering these broad range of missing middle housing choices in communities across the country. And so this is just right, in addition in the 1970s, late 60s through even the 1980s, um, zoning delivered really bad infill results. And you know, it didn't take me long. I just went into to, to Google Earth and did a little bit of um, sort of walking around. This is from Traverse City, and found you know this um, really incompatible, fairly unattractive um, infill project that happened that zoning allowed. And in many instances, the response to this infill that was really out of scale and character. The pushback was such that a lot in a lot of instances, the zoning was down zoned to only allow single family housing. And just a little bit of comic relief is I'm not sure where these mansard roofs came from in the 1970s, but they seem to be ubiquitous in, in pretty much every city in the country got some of these mansarded roof forms in these um, unattractive infill projects in the 1970s. So what is missing middle housing and why is it important? And so um, just a little bit of a timeline. Um, I introduced the concept of missing middle housing at a new partners for Mark smart growth conference in 2011. Um, we created, we at Opticos created the missing middle diagram for an article I wrote in 2012 for the smart growth compendium. Um, in 2016, we launched missingmiddlehousing.com because there was such a growing interest in this topic and we wanted to provide free um, information to inform the conversations that were happening. And then earlier this year, as Linda mentioned, um, my book, Missing Middle Housing, was released by Island Press. Um, so the, the way that we frame this missing middle conversation is that right on the left hand side of this diagram are the single family detached houses. Uh, we've done a really great job of putting systems in place, whether it be zoning, financing, uh, construction systems to deliver that single family home. We were doing a really great job of that. On the far right hand side is over the course of the last 15 to 20 years in particular, most cities have changed their zoning 
uh, financing financers have figured out how to um, uh, finance these larger, you know, three, five, up to seven story uh, residential or mixed use buildings. But it's all of these housing types in the middle um, that existed historically. It's the duplex, it's the triplex, it's the cottage court, it's the small courtyard apartment or mansion apartment or the live work unit that existed historically and made up a really important core of our neighborhoods and provided a broad range of housing choices and affordability that we really stopped building. Um, we haven't delivered much of it in the last uh, 40, 50, 60 years. And so uh, that's why we call it missing. And so um, a really important sort of aspect of this, this is our definition of missing middle, is that they're house scale buildings that just happen to have multiple units um, that are located within walkable neighborhoods. And that, um, that house scale concept is a really important takeaway for you. If you're gonna take away one concept from this presentation is that missing middle housing are house scale buildings that just happen to have multiple units within it. And just as an example, this is a great recently built triplex in a project in the Salt Lake City region. And if you weren't looking very carefully and you were driving by this or riding your bike or walking by this, you would never notice that it wasn't just a large or medium sized single family home. But, it, and, but what it is, it delivers three high quality um, units in a, in a house scale building. And so it fits in very nicely on a block that has mostly single family homes. And it really takes a closer look in most cases, whether counting mailboxes, uh, looking at meters, noticing that there's a couple of doors, to notice that there are multiple units in that building um, and that it's not a single family home. And, you know, I'm always excited to just mention that the missing middle housing concept has really become a movement, um, not just across the United States, but become a movement internationally. Um, there are, there are a lar large number of applications in Australia, including the state of New South Wales that created their own version of the missing middle diagram. And Toronto's having a very robust missing middle housing conversation. So it's great to see that this is spreading to sort of every corner um, and informing the housing conversation. And, and the, the missing middle housing is middle in two different ways. Um, first and foremost, um, this is really important, it's the middle form and scale. It's that scale between the single family homes and multifamily buildings or that house scale. And secondarily, um, the missing middle housing types can deliver affordability by design to middle income households. Let me dive a little bit deeper into that. So what we find is that when we're defining what house scale means and thinking about how you might effectively regulate that, that building, not just building height is important, but regulating a maximum building width and a maximum building depth is also very important as well. And this is probably one of the most important concepts of missing middle housing that is often missed in its application. So back to this point of affordability and how missing middle ties in and informs the affordable housing conversation is we, we often show this barbell image that we created. And on one side of the afford, affordable housing conversation, you have capital A affordable or subsidized housing, which is really important uh, for the delivery of <coughs> housing choices uh, to lower income households. On the right hand side of the conversation, you have this, this need to increase housing supply just generally to take some of the pressure off the supply and demand equation. But right in the middle, uh, missing middle sets sits and um, what we have found in projects across the country and in uh, applications with cities is that it can deliver affordability by design um, if done effectively, typically to medium, middle income households and that the percentage of um, uh, median income that that hits varies um, city to city or region to region. But we, what we usually find is that at about 60 to 70% of median income and above is usually what a thoughtful approach to missing middle housing can sort of deliver a, a attainable housing for and anything below that typically would require um, some sort of subsidy. So it's, it's a delivering affordability by design, which is an, 
Is it not the only piece of the affordable housing equation, but can be a really important and effective tool for addressing and delivering affordable housing? So why do we call it missing? This is a really um, a great graph that we generated from the American Housing Survey data that um, between 1990 and 2013, less than 10% of all housing units produced were missing middle housing scale. And we define that as a building that's 19 units or less. And since the, the, the early 1970s, there's been a steady decline in the percentage of housing delivered being missing middle. And so, right, this is the reason we call it missing because we have delivered very, very little of it uh, starting in the 1970s. And so, um, there are a lot of barriers, and I could I could give a two-hour presentation simply about barriers. Um, the the great thing is that when I got a chance to sit down and take some time and write uh, my book, Missing Middle Housing, I actually had a chance to research um, and um, write about each of these barriers in more detail. So if you're interested in finding out more of these, you can uh, please uh, take take a look at a copy of my book. But um, it starts with planning and zoning barriers, right? There's often community opposition and pushback to anything non-single family. Um, the missing middle types are not easily classifiable in, in construction industry standards. They're not single family detached and they're not necessarily what most builders think about when they think about multifamily. And so they, they're kind of in this little nebulous area of, of not being easily classifiable. There's perceived cost inefficiencies for building small that uh, creative developers are figuring out how to work around. Um, right, there's additional risk if you start thinking about um, delivery of condominium projects. Um, and right, there's just additional complexities and costs related to commercial building codes of once you get to three units or more. And so, unfortunately, this list is long. I'm happy to answer questions you might have about these barriers. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the planning and zoning barriers, but um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on. So I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of what are the missing middle housing types and sort of broad range. And I, I think it's really important um, to shift the conversation and shift the planning and the zoning away from a focus on density and shift that to a conversation and, and a strategy to implement these broad range of housing types. And so one of the things we've done over the course of the last 10 years is really clearly define each of these missing middle housing types and their physical parameters. So it's really important to, for everybody that's participating in these conversations to understand that when we say fourplex, we're thinking about a very specific built form in a building type or a cottage court. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really good to educate and to give a really foundational baseline to everybody in the understanding of these housing types. And so just to give a quick photographic overview of, of these types, we have duplex side by side where it's really just uh, two units sort of attached um, on one wall. Uh, it can be one story, it can be two stories. Uh, you could regulate it for either one of those. You can see some really great sort of examples from across the country with different architectural vocabulary. Um, then there's the duplex stacked. Um, basically, this is, is typically used on a, a less wide lot where there's a unit on the ground floor um, and then there's a unit stacked above it. So in the image on the left, you can see one door enters directly into the ground floor unit and the other door on the opposite side goes up a flight of stairs to that second unit. Once again, these, most, most of the time these types exist on blocks that have uh, primarily single family homes where there's just a, a, a number of these integrated effectively into that block. and then. Then there's a cottage court, which tends to be a favorite of a lot of folks. Um, it's been very successful in its application across the country. Uh, it's, what this is is just a series of very small footprint, um, a single family detached cottages oriented around a shared green space. Um, and um, there's one of, here's one of my favorites is the fourplex. And I, I feel like if we could figure out how to effectively deliver the fourplex. And if your region could, I think it could go a long way in delivering um, uh, attainable housing choices, both for sale and for rent. But what this is, is basically a building with two units on the ground floor and then two units stacked above um, on, the up, on the second floor. And a lot of times they have separate doors. Um, in this particular instance on the left, you see that the, the doors on the two opposite sides enter the units on the ground floor. And then the door in the middle is a shared 
a set of stairs that takes you up to the two units on that top floor. Um, and there's the townhouse, which is a fairly straightforward type. Um, this triplex, um, some places it's called a triple decker. Um, I'll say that in most instances, the missing middle housing conversation sort of is capped at like that two and two and a half story scale. Um, but um, in some instances, that third story makes sense and it has happened historically or it makes sense in certain locations. And so this is a great type with just three stacked units on a, can be on as narrow as a 30 foot lot. And then a, a multiplex that'd be sort of uh, five units or more in a house scale building that is two to two and a half stories. Um, I really like this live work unit as well. Um, these are, they provide a flex space on the ground floor with a townhouse unit above it. Uh, they're really great small business incubators and provide, can provide really great transitions um, from main streets into neighborhoods or great, great buildings to have on corners of neighborhoods. The, the image on the right of here is a live work unit we recently designed in a project in Nebraska I'll show you in a little bit that has incubated a couple of small businesses like this pizza shop, which has even been successful in this time of, of COVID and social distancing, as well as a small yoga studio. So they can be really great business incubators. So where, where, where should you consider applying missing middle housing? Um, as a starting point, in most of your communities, there are areas where these, these missing middle housing types probably already exist. Um, the first step is to make sure that these new versions of these housing types are allowed in areas where there's already missing middle types. Uh, secondarily, you need to be thinking about small individual lot infill. Uh, you know, this is depending on your lot patterns, anywhere from a 30 foot wide lot um, uh, or like a 50 foot typical lot width in many places. Um, along secondary corridors, you know, sometimes these are corridors that historically have been commercial or maybe even single family detached. Uh, they, they, they've seen a, a sort of a, a several decades of disinvestment, uh, low, low property values. These are really great opportunities to think about um, the application of missing middle housing types. Um, Transitions from higher intensity corridors. Um, now this would, will vary obviously based on the size of your community. It may just be a corridor that allows two, three or four stories or maybe even commercial uses where the missing middle housing provides a really great transition from those corridors into primarily single family neighborhoods. Um, thinking about older strip malls, um, older mall sites that are either dead or nearly at the end of their lifespan, um, as these sites are redeveloped either into new commercial or maybe mixed use, um, the missing middle housing types are a really great palette of types that can provide a really great transition from these uh, sort of project focal points that may be higher intensity into the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, so we've also seen that um, uh, we need to think very carefully about where um, you map the allowance of the missing middle housing types. This was a zoning analysis with the missing middle lens we did for Medford, Oregon. And what we found is that the areas in red are where they allow the missing middle or multifamily housing and the dotted ovals are where the, the community patterns deliver walkability. And so there's a real detach between where you would ideally want to allow these multi-unit housing types in the missing middle and where their current zoning actually allows it. And then, right, the bigger picture question is, um, the, and this is the most progressive strategy that I, that I noted earlier, is some cities and some regions, some states are saying, well, is, is our housing problem getting, getting to the point where we need to actually think about allowing these missing middle housing types in uh, current single family zoning codes? And I know that's a really politically um, sort of loaded topic, but it's just something that many places are considering and have considered just to address their, their dire housing needs. So what are some of the typical um, planning and zoning barriers? So back to this, um, this notion, I'm just going to reinforce this, is that we need to be thinking about building types, not densities or FAR, or these other sort of metrics that we often sort of default to. Um, many, you know, the current zoning system that's based on density assumes that a higher density building equals a big building. And I think part of what Missing Middle does is it debunks that myth because this great little two-story courtyard apartment building, which I think a lot of communities would, would, would uh, welcome, 
and their communities actually generates a density of, of 80 units per acre, which is completely unheard of in a lot of these small communities, but it just makes the point that density is not a really great target. And I, I highly recommend that uh, cities stop talking about density and start talking about housing choices and housing types instead because of this. Uh, most zoning codes um, do not see the difference between these two buildings, the left-hand one being a great uh, missing middle fourplex, great porch engaging the street, and on the right being one of those sort of um, unfortunate 1970s infill projects. Um, has the same height, same density, same setbacks, but um, what the zoning doesn't realize is there are some of the form characteristics that a form-based code would typically regulate that are really important for effective implementation for these types of housing choices. The problems that we usually see in zoning codes is we see that the metrics are often wrong or the standards with, um, are often off, densities are too low, minimum lot size is too large, setbacks are too large. Um, and so it's, we, we go, typically go through a process and this graph on the right hand side shows sort of us analyzing where current zoning, uh, what density's current zoning allows versus what it needs to allow to enable um, all the missing middle housing types. Um, in some instances, the zones that allow missing middle housing are actually missing altogether. The zoning districts jump from single family detached housing up to some multifamily zoning district that allows up to like a 45 or 55 foot tall building. And so um, we've also just done a really bad job historically of um, mapping areas, uh, percentage of areas for non-single family, the percentage of most cities and small towns even, a large percentage of areas only allow single family detached. So that's something to think about. Um, and I mentioned this earlier. So another major barrier that I know is a hot topic for you all, and it's one that's a very contentious conversation everywhere, but parking and off street parking requirements are a major barrier for the delivery of missing middle housing. And I just encourage everyone to think creatively uh, about approach to parking and you know, some of the messages that I use is that we've done a much better job providing spaces for cars than places for people to live. Um, that you really can't be for attainable or affordable housing and also for high off street parking requirements. Um, they're just sort of counterintuitive and the high parking often makes it harder to deliver that affordability or attainability. And the, the other thing we find in our work is that the more cars you require off street, the more incompatible it is likely that the development will be as it tries to cram um, sort of all that parking into the building or onto the to the lot, especially on smaller lots. So just uh, I just decided um, I randomly picked a local, a regional example. Um, it, there was no uh, this is not to be super critical. This is just to show an example. I picked Bel Air, Michigan. Um, this is an aerial photo. I was like I often do this. I dive into the zoning code. So this is the zoning map. Um, there's two zoning districts that are multifamily. There's a multifamily and a high density residential, but you can see the pink and the brown here that they're mapped on very targeted and very limited areas, probably for a pre-existing uh, apartment project. And then there's this village commons zoning district, which uh, seems to be the best opportunity for the application of missing middle housing. Um, and it's mapped in the right locations to, to think about missing middle housing as well. The classification is for mixed use. Uh, so it's a little bit broad. It doesn't really clearly define where there might be a desire for commercial uses versus residential, but at least it allows the opportunity to think about the application of missing middle. But then when you jump a little bit more into the, the um, allowed uses and some of the metrics, and this is not uncommon. Um, I can, pretty much any zoning code I find within you know, 15 to 30 minutes, I can find some barriers. But if you look at that village common zoning district, and go to multifamily dwellings as an allowed use that it requires a special permit to actually do a multi-unit sort of missing middle scale project. So what this does is it's not allowed by right. It's a major disincentive. It's a barrier and a risk for a builder. So it's not likely that a, a small builder is going to come in and try to figure out a way to deliver missing middle housing in a context like this. And then the minimum lot sizes are too large for the missing middle housing types and the setbacks are also too large and really discourage and really don't even enable the application of these types on some of the smaller infill lots that exist in, in many of these um, uh, historic portions of these communities in particular. So um, 
wanted to talk a little bit about how can you, as a region, take some of this knowledge, take some of these ideas, and, and identify, be more specific about identifying the barriers and figuring out where to apply um, sort of these missing middle housing types. I'd say that I often tell communities and, and groups like yours and, and this audience that this type of effort is really like brain surgery, that you need a diagnosis first of like what specifically is the issue. Um, you wouldn't go into brain surgery without having a diagnosis first. And then you need to, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go to your general practitioner to have your brain surgery done. You should really hire somebody who has a knowledge of this to apply it. And, and do it most effectively and have the, the most effective results. And so um, starting with a conversation about desired, having a conversation about desired urban form, this is a graphic uh, I created for the book that just shows the same building footprint um, that has one unit, two units, four units, and eight units within it. And just saying that most importantly, let's think about regulating that desired form and having more flexibility on the number of units that are allowed within that form. Um, informing the conversation about housing and actually showing um, sort of the actual cost impacts of the required parking on either the rental housing or the for sale housing we find is really important. We've done this on a lot of our code projects and modeling that impact is a really great way to inform uh, that, the conversation and then um, we've developed a process called the missing middle scan in the deep dive that I want. It really provides this diagnosis and the, 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 the correct route to that surgery or those targeted fixes to enable missing middle. So the steps in this uh, missing middle scan are first identifying where the application makes sense. We go through a series of mapping exercises. We use GIS data. Uh, so we use Google Earth. And we very thoughtfully identify what we call missing middle ready locations. You know, this might be in historic centers, it might be at the edges of town to find growth areas. And this just becomes a priority of like high, medium, of low of, of where a city should consider applying and enabling the missing middle housing types. Then we specifically, as I, as I showed earlier, drilled down. This was in Greenville, South Carolina. We did both the county and the city where um, we identified the gap between allowed densities, maximum densities in zoning districts, and in the green boxes, the densities that would be necessary to allow each of the missing middle housing types along the bottom of this table. So you can see the dashed line represents the zoning districts and that the maximum densities allowed, and the green boxes um, show the range of densities that need to be allowed uh, to enable these types. You can see there's a pretty tremendous gap in, in a lot of instances in that. Um, we sort of dive into uh, a lot of places have neighborhood plans, downtown plans, corridor plans that we identify sort of the opportunities and barriers within those planning documents for missing middle. And then probably the most important part of this and most effective in communicating is this graphic testing of the zoning district. So we'll pick a series of two to three, sometimes four of the most applicable zoning districts, and we tip pick um, anywhere from three to four typical lot sizes that exist within each of those zoning districts. And then we go through this process of doing this graphic testing and it's testing of, on the left-hand side, we show what the maximum building envelope is. And that's kind of the hypothetical of what could be allowed. In the middle is what the regulations actually encourage to be built. And in a lot of instances, even just simply the parking requirements are encouraging uh, the, the, the delivery of a single family detached house, even in a zoning district uh, that allows um, uh, higher densities or uh, multi-unit housing types or multi-family housing types. And then the right hand image is we say, well, on this particular lot size, what would be the ideal missing middle uh, build out? And then we revert, can, can recommend reverse engineering the zoning standards to allow that specific housing type in a broad range of other missing middle housing types. And um, I'm just gonna talk about, so I think it's a really important part of this message is in your zoning is to just be really direct in your zoning about what you want. And we recommend embedding the allowed range of missing middle types you want within each of the zoning districts. And this is just an example of one of the form-based codes we've written. And this um, zoning district is called a neighborhood small footprint. And the right-hand side is the table of the range of 
uh, missing middle housing types that are allowed within that zoning district um, and tied to a minimum lot size. Um, we also sort of dive very specifically into a citywide comprehensive plan policy and make recommendations there as well. But what I would suggest is that, um, you know, it seems like you have a really great um, uh, organ organized effort here with, um, with this Housing North um, uh, in your housing conversations. And I highly suggest that um, your region um, sort of think about um, sort of completing one of these missing middle scans and even thinking about a model code. So instead of every jurisdiction, which I think um, Sarah mentioned, maybe there were like 109 different um, government entities that why not create a shared code template that might be a zoning district, might be a couple zoning district that each of your jurisdictions could share to effectively implement missing middle housing and remove the barriers across your 10 county um, district. And I think that um, having the consistency of that shared model code across jurisdictions could help ease long terms administration. Uh, could it could sort of give builders predictability as they might be building in multiple jurisdiction, and um, uh, maybe it, it. I think it just could be a really great approach to thinking about how to how to remove these barriers in your districts. A few examples. I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly, um, but there's other rural sort of small town um, regions in the country like Beaufort County, South Carolina, that did a shared model code uh, that we delivered now six or seven years ago that the development community really got behind and were really excited to support in the end. That's a good, good model to look at. Same types of places starting as a, at a rural hamlet and up to a, a small town or city. Um, they had a shared model code that had minor modifications for each application, uh, but shared a real sort of a basic framework um, across jurisdictions. And then we did a similar effort for Kauai County, starting with their island-wide general plan. And they have a shared form-based framework that's sort of systematically going um, sort of a place type by place type, a small village, a rural crossroads, a town, and applying this, this shared framework uh, with form-based code application to enable missing middle housing types. And so, um, right, this isn't just a concept that um, has, has gained support in, in only planners' minds. Um, the building community, uh, NAHB, National Association of Home Builders, is really getting behind this. ULI has had some really robust conversations about this. Um, so I wanted to show some examples uh, really quickly about how builders are applying to missing middle housing. And um, this is a really interesting, all these examples are from uh, the Missing Middle Housing book. Um, one of the examples I wanted to show is a project in Portland where a really innovative developer uh, took a, a two and a half story a Victorian, historic Victorian home and actually um, uh, renovated it and created it, uh, adapted it into a fourplex uh, with four units without actually changing the scale of the building at all, which I think is a really fantastic case study. It's, it's a bit challenging to make these sorts of adaptive reuses and conversions uh, financially feasible, but I think it's something to think about. Um, a lot of people's favorites, a lot of communities' favorites um, is the cottage court. Uh, this is a great cottage court in Greenwich, Rhode Island, done by uh, my, our colleagues at Union Studio. Uh, this is just a really great example. There's a tremendous amount of demand, um, both at an attainable price point and a market rate price point for these types of cottage clusters. And this particular one, um, was built about a block and a half from the small town Main Street. And I would say that, um, you know, this and this project uh, generates a density of about 18 units per acre, which is considered pretty high in most um, zoning codes in your region from what I, I gained from a glance. But this is a really great type to think about enabling. Um, and how would codes like the one we just like look like in Bel Air Bel Air um, enable this. It seems like there would be barriers in place that need to be changed to enable this, this great housing type to be built. Um, we designed, master planned, and did the, the missing middle housing type design for this great new neighborhood in the Omaha Metro in the city of Papillion, Nebraska. It now has 130 units built. Um, there are no more, there, there's no more than eight units in a building. Um, and it's really creating a neighborhood um, in, in a class A multifamily context instead of just a project with a cluster of buildings oriented around a parking lot and shared open space. The idea was 
right, to create a neighborhood with a variety of different missing middle types and scales of buildings, as well as a neighborhood Main Street as a focal point. Um, really great. Um, the, the market is responding super well. Uh, this is a sixplex uh, that was built in the first phase. Um, our client is saying that, especially during these times of social distancing and, and COVID, that his tenants are really happy that they have their own separate entrance, that they have their own private porch, um, that they have a neighborhood to go walk in as opposed to walking through a parking lot. And so just a really great example of how we can rethink uh, multifamily with missing middle housing and how it's been done successfully across the country. Um, if you wanna take a snapshot of this video, there's a great fly-through video that our client recently completed at this um, URL uh, that I, I just encourage you to go look at if you're interested in finding out more about this particular project. Uh, we worked recently with Sonoma County, uh, California Habitat for Humanity to deliver. Uh, we worked with Marianne Casado, who um, was one of the major proponents of the Katrina cottages um, on, a, on a cottage, a pilot project cottage uh, community uh, that was in response to the dire need for housing post wildfires in Northern California. Um, this was recently uh, sort of was built sort of late summer of last year, uh, very successful. And the idea was that these cottages um, would be used to be built in backyards of houses as they're being rebuilt, rebuilt and then left in those backyards as a second stream of income and as an affordable housing uh, type for um, households in that region. And so uh, we're also working on a really another really interesting project. I just want to mention it because it's sort of in the context of a of the parking conversation is there is a growing desire for car free living, even in smaller communities. And uh, we're working on a project called cul-de-sac Tempe in Tempe, Arizona, in a, in a non urban location that's um, delivering car free living and has over 3000 people registered for a project that only is uh, 600 units. So just a really high demand uh, for really innovative thinking. So some concluding thoughts, a few takeaways. Um, a couple of really good resources. Um, uh, if you go to opticosdesign.com, you can buy uh, my book, much of which I talked about, and, and a lot more, a very graphic oriented book. And if you use uh, Parolic, my last name, you get a 20% discount uh, when it takes you to Island Press. Um, you can also go to missingmiddlehousing.com. There's a lot of free information on the site that we created now four years ago, if you're just interested in sort of um, peeking at that, looking at some more photos, some examples. And I just, I like to close by just saying that I, I'm just super excited that um, the conversation has spread, you know, places like Northwest Michigan is sort of utilizing this concept, Australia, Sydney, Brisbane, uh, state of New South Wales, Toronto, many cities across the United States are using this and, and as a way to really address the, the growing and the dire need for more housing choices, and in, in, in most instances, more attainable or affordable housing choices. And I think that each of us, whether we are a um, architect, a planner, a developer, a decision maker, um, a financer, a real estate agent, we all play a role in the delivery of these missing middle housing types uh, because there is such a dire need. And I would say that a little bit of sort of comic relief to end this, ARP sort of framed this conversation in the context of the Golden Girls trend. Um, it's a little bit harder now with COVID, um, unless you're in a cluster already, but um, right, more and more boomers, uh, which make up a, a large percentage of the demand for the missing middle types, are looking for alternative housing choices as they, as they age. And back to this, um, uh, in closing, the, my great-grandmother's duplex um, in Colum small town of Columbus, Nebraska. Um, what happened shortly after she passed away, I think this was in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the zoning actually encouraged this to get built on the site. It's a very suburban, one-story office building with a you know, 10, 12 to 15 car parking lot that they tore down the missing middle housing, which was providing great choices, and the zoning actually didn't allow for residential, it only allowed for professional office. And so this is what got built. And we see this happening in a lot of um, smaller communities that have zoning that's really effective in, in, in protecting and delivering missing middle housing. And so, um, you know, regardless of, you know, if you're in one of the small hamlets, uh, villages, townships, um, uh, towns or cities, 
you know, there's, there, is, there is a need, there's a growing demand for these housing types. And what I say is often say to close is that the market is waiting, the market, the market is in need, and will each of us step up and play the role that we need to play to help in the delivery of these housing types in the missing middle housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. I hope that uh, those of you with us today uh, can see how uh, accessible Dan's um, uh, theories and, and movement is, and his book is the same. He uses lots of uh, photographs and graphics to help make this information um, palatable and, and interesting to, um, to everyone. And I, I think one of the secrets to this is not only educating uh, people on who are builders or developers or zoners, but also people who live in cities and neighborhoods uh, so that they are not afraid of this. We, we find in our area that there's an automatic, we, we started to uh, reduce parking minimums and people automatically get their anti-new urbanism, anti-density uh, arguments going. And I think that uh, one of the things, Dan, that you had in your presentation that I think makes this, um, uh, so that everyone can understand it is everything old is new again. And I think going through a town and finding the pictures of these existing missing middle pieces that are still there is a good way to start this conversation. Have you had much uh, to do with the public engagement um, as you enter a community with these, with these ideas and, and uh, removing the obstacles to these kind of builds? Oh, oh absolutely. I would say 99% of our projects, whether they're uh, public urban planning projects for a city or a county or a developer driven project there's always a robust engagement process and um i i completely agree with your point i i often say and i emphasize in the book that don't overcomplicate the start of the conversation is start by showing photographs of the the local or regional examples you may not have enough local especially in the smaller towns so it may need to be more regional but there, it's really invaluable to start with those photographs because a lot of people in the community who are very passionate about their community may not, like you might draft a new zoning code, they may not have the technical ability to jump into that zoning code and understand what it's, you know, what exactly to respond to, but they can say, they can point to that great little cottage court that they know down the street or around the corner from the house and say, well, will the, will the zoning, the new zoning allow this? Or will it not allow that really bad example that exists around the corner as well? Or how will it not example? And so we find having posters or a digital database in a, in a platform like a Flickr is really invaluable. And that's why the foundation for the missingmiddlehousing.com website was, was a photo database um, that keeps growing. And um, when we do a project, we have posters that every time we're doing a community meeting, we have a poster of cottage courts. We have a poster of townhouses, of fourplexes, duplexes, and it's it's just a great foundation and a starting point. And um, the other thing I encourage is walking tours. And unfortunately, it's a little bit harder these days with COVID. But um, uh, it, you know, getting out and actually seeing these places is invaluable. Personalizing the stories about who lives in them, and um, you know, what we're finding is that. Um, Right, there's this debate about sort of tying this to COVID of, you know, people are moving from the urban cities to the suburbs. And part of what I'm saying is that, well, there's, there's a missing middle there too. Like there's what we call middle neighborhoods. It's the neighborhoods with these mix of house scale missing middle housing types that like nobody's talking about. They had a growing demand prior to COVID and I feel really strongly because they uh, provide a, a really high quality of life even during COVID with, you know, I call it just enough elbow room, um, uh, but with population densities that can support that local coffee shop or that restaurant or that small market that it's, it's a really great in between. Um, so I feel like, um, you know, the demand is only going to increase, uh, like it was growing prior to COVID and I feel like because it has been so responsive, it's only going to continue to increase sort of assuming we get through this, um, hopefully sometime soon. So you didn't speak to this, um, but it is certainly pertinent to this region. And that is uh, in our area, when we see some interesting uh, projects going up of, of a smaller scale and a little higher density, uh, I'm always excited. 
uh, and then uh, you know halfway through it, I find out that it's going to be a short-term rental because we have the pressure of tourism here. Uh, and as a as a planning commission, we have worked very hard to uh, reduce the number of areas where uh, those sorts of uh, builds are are uh, uh, an allowed use. But we've had a real pushback from the development community saying that. Uh, they can't afford to build these smaller things unless they can have uh, short-term rental income. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you've been in communities where there is that kind of pressure, uh, where these kind of smaller scale projects turn into short-term rentals instead of housing for people who are living and working in your area. Yeah, I think it, unfortunately, it's pretty common um, uh, in both large cities like in Austin that we've worked in as well as smaller cities in sort of tourist oriented areas like your region and access to the lakes. Um, I would say that um, there's, not a, there's not a single solution. I think every city that has, has addressed it has addressed it in their own unique way. And I, I encourage cities to definitely um, address it because um, especially if it is exacerbating the the uh, uh, affordability uh, issue in the context, I would say that it's it's not a it's not a conversation specific to missing middle, but it is a conversation specific to policy and uh, planning and even zoning regulations in some instances. So I definitely encourage cities to look at it. I would say that um, I don't have a magic uh, solution or or necessarily a specific recommendation because I found that every context requires a unique solution um, to that, and I just encourage cities to be aware of it and address it as it's becoming an issue for sure. I, I just want to thank you so much for the book and also your presentation and the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, people who are watching today, there is a live Q&A at 3.30. Uh, and if you would send your questions to info at housingnorth.org, we will get those to Dan and he will be um, uh, responding directly to you. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Linda.